So today I'm doing something I don't like to do. Um, we, well, I say I don't like to do. I sold a house or I contracted a house rather. We did a rehab on a house a couple of years ago and we rented it to this family from California. Um, great family, they've taken great care of the house. Um, absolutely the ideal tenants. Uh, rent's always timely. They take care of everything. If something's wrong, they communicate. Perfect tenants. Uh, and they were in what I would consider a perfect house. This was a beautiful rehab. I'll show you some pictures. Um, well, here's the deal. They fell in love with the house. And quite honestly, they love the house more than um, more than the value of the house. Um, or it's at a good point. You know, it's a good solid number for this house in this market with all things considered. So I, I don't like selling houses. I'm gonna say that over and over again. The last house we sold was probably five, six years ago. Uh, Heck, it might have been longer than that. Um, five, six years ago, and we went into it pretty well knowing we were going to sell it. I really wanted to keep it, but uh, the location was less than ideal. So I went ahead and sold it. Uh, and I told myself I wasn't gonna do that again because we, going back in history, that house we purchased for $50,000. We did like a $30,000 rehab on it. Uh, we sold it for 140-ish, maybe 145. So we made some money there. But here's the deal: you end up paying taxes on it. Uh, you know, it's not that great. But here's the kicker: like two years later, that same family sold the house for like 200,000. Well, it sold again for like 230, and and then. Uh, just here recently, uh, it sold for almost $300,000. And that's just over the course of uh, a few years. I mean, literally a few years for a house that started out at $50,000. I'll show you some pictures. This was a, a beautiful house. I love the house. It was just the, the neighbors and the neighborhood is really the only reason I sold the house. I was like, I'll go ahead and take the money. Um, in had had it just been renters that were next door or something like that, I would have probably not even sold it. But these people own the house and it was chaos there all the time. So I was like, I'm just not going to mess with it. Uh, you know, I, I figured this was going to be a long term deal. So I went ahead and sold it. Um, but long story short, going back to the California, going back to the current house. Uh, again, another beautiful house. We did a great uh, rehab on it. Uh, it's a beautiful home and it turned out perfect. Home from 1928. Uh, you know, basically we bought it for $50,000. It was a hoarder house. Um, I mean, it was literally hidden from the road. You, you didn't even know it was there. Um, and w the people who owned it lived next door to it. And it was his mom's. And uh, just just a very interesting story. We ended up buying it. It hadn't been occupied in 15 years, something like that. So we literally did all new plumbing, all new electric, uh, just everything. New HVAC, new insulation, new everything. It was a new home. It was a new home on an old frame. Um, new flooring. I mean, it, it was just beautiful, beautiful home. Um, so anyway, these people fell in love with it and they're like, David, we love this home. We don't want to move. Um, we want to buy it. And you know, the first few times I was like, nah, I don't want to sell it. I don't want to sell it. Matter of fact, quite honestly, my wife isn't happy about me selling it either, but the numbers make sense. And here's one of the reasons the numbers make sense is rather than paying taxes on it, um, so we're gonna sell it. 
um, and this is just some round numbers. You, we've got about a hundred thousand in it. Let's say we bought it for fifty, and we did another fifty in rehab. Um, but the thing is, we're in it at a hundred. It's worth, you know, two fifty-ish. Um, I think the county tax. You know, I always argue that because that's not the same of what it's really worth. Um, we've got it down to about 200 there. I think Zillow says it's worth 250 ish, you know, 240, 250. But again, they kind of computate off of the appraised value too. So if you can hold that appraised value down, um, it's going to give you lower computation anyway. Um, it is a factor. Uh, but it's not the only factor. But uh, with that, um, so we're selling it to them for $288,000. Um, $288,000, we should net, there's no real estate agents in it or anything like that, so there's no fees. Uh, we should net $180,000, you know, $185,000 out of that, uh, which we can put back to work. And here's how we can put it back to work. This is the long, the long story getting to the point. Um, there's a 1031 exchange and basically a 1031 exchange allows us to buy. So we can sell this property. We can postpone the taxes on it by um, purchasing like property. Um, if we do something similar, you know, we're in a single family home now, but it is an investment property. But if we put it in there and uh, we uh, we reinvest it into a like, I mean, it can be land, it can be commercial real estate, uh, it can be any of that. Uh, but if we do something of like value, um, which are any of that investment grade material, um, now there are restrictions and standards and so forth, but this is kind of the, the high level overview of a 1031 exchange and the high level overview just says is if we do a, a like kind exchange, uh, we can defer the taxes on that and it'll go into the new property. And if we sell that new property, then taxes would be paid on that. Um, so it, it gives us the ability to step up into a higher level or multi-tiered uh, investment. So we could put that into several properties. We could put it into a mix of commercial. We could do it in land, whatever the case may be. Basically, we just need to reinvest it. Um, there are restrictions to that. You know, you can't do a 1031 exchange on your uh can't do a 1031 exchange on primary residence and you can't do it on flipping because it's not investment property. Uh, so those are kind of both exclusions as well that come into play. There's also an exclusion like if one of your investment properties becomes your primary rear, your primary uh, residence, you have to own that for like five years or you end up having to pay the taxes back. So they don't want you just gaming the system. This is not to game it. And it's already a law that allows you to postpone the taxes. So, you know, they want you to play within the within the guidelines. So we're looking, so we better take that $185,000 and redeploy it. Uh, there are rules. The rules are um, we've got to declare, um, what properties, you know, we're, we're saying we're going to reinvest into these properties within 45 days. So we're basically declaring what we're investing in. And this is all very regulated through someone who specializes in doing 1031 exchanges. We have someone here locally who can do that for us. Um, he'll take care of all of it. We don't ever get to touch the money. Uh, he does all of that. Once you touch the money, um, it's game over. You can't do that. Um, they control it all. It's a very documented process. Um, very, very detailed. Um, but, uh, anyway, uh, $185,000 we've got to spend 
on new property within 45 days or or uh, so the time of the closing so we just contracted the house that we're selling so up until we close that that time doesn't count but once it's closed and it's funded and it's in the 1031 exchange within 45 days we've got to say hey we're spending the money here on a qualified purchase so with the qualified purchase we uh then have to close it within 180 days pretty sure that's correct 180 days uh and then it's solid uh and then you don't have to pay any taxes on all those gains uh let me rephrase that you postpone the taxes on those gains you are still paying on it now if you continue to step up uh you could postpone indefinitely i mean to the point where you die or it's you know transferred or whatever the case may be uh and then your family gets a stepped up value on the uh on the uh property um so they kind of hit the reset button and it starts all over this is one of the really huge aspects of investing in real estate property I mean, it's, I mean, this is huge. I mean, it's, it's a really big win. And so imagine, you know, this is a property, I'm thinking it's three years. They've been tenants in this property for three years. We went through, now this was a longer rehab. Um, it took us, I'm wanting to say seven months to get this one done. But, you know, imagine I've got a full-time job. I've got a crew, you know, I've got people going through, it wasn't the perfect, uh, you know, it wasn't a perfect, this isn't a three week, uh, rehab. This is something, uh, where we did everything to this house. Matter of fact, it had brick on it, uh, a very odd, weird brick and it was falling off. We pulled the old brick off. We rebricked the house. You go through all the inspections. It, so honestly, it took us seven months. Um, but with that said, um, you know, just over a few years, we've created $185,000 in equity on this place. And that's, it's pretty darn good. Um, we're going to put that back to work. So, you know, one of the big dilemmas right now is where do you find cash flow? Uh, and that's the crux of everything we do here is reimagining retirement and investing for cash flow. Well, it's harder right now because rates are higher, um, properties are still expensive, and it makes it difficult to, uh, to find property to invest in. But it's a numbers game and it's just, you're working a formula, you plug it in, you can, you can put more money down, you can over, uh, over, you know, overfund this. You can do a lot of different things to create cash flow. You can put it in several different houses, you know, leveraging the bank's money with yours. I mean, you're allowed to borrow with this. Uh, that may be a question that comes up. Um, you know, let's say we're, we've got $180,000. We can go out and buy $500,000 worth of property, you know, whatever, whatever the case may be, the 180 could just be our down payment are twenty percent down, so you've got you know seven million in buy or not uh, seven hundred thousand in buying power uh, that you can get into, you know, or actually it's probably 800000 uh, eight hundred thousand in uh, if you're putting twenty percent down. So the fact is, is that you can, I mean, you can leverage into a much larger deal. And my thought on this is, we'll purchase another cash flowing asset will uh or assets and will will put it into a deal and here's the interesting thing you know just another idea here that we need to pay attention to because here's here's what's going on in the market when everybody was feeling good about uh real estate and everybody was oh this is the greatest time and everybody's buying, 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 and everything's expensive, like prices through the roof. And, you know, everybody's just buying everything up, gobbling it up. And, you know, granted, um, 
money was cheaper then. You know, when you're getting it at 4% uh, at a local bank or something like that, it, it makes a lot of sense. But when, uh, when it's at 8%, it makes the deals a lot harder. And But here's the thing we're finding better deals now again. You know, the deals that you can get on houses are so much better right now uh, that instead of buying when it's a madhouse and crazy and everybody's flurry and I've got to overspend and give up looking, well, let's look at it while everyone's afraid. And I know everybody's, a lot of people have heard, you know, when there's fear, you know, you want to, you want to buy and, you know, when a you know, I'll put the saying on the screen, uh, but uh, anyhow, uh, or blood in the street, you know, that's when to buy. But people don't do that in real life. You know, they get all scared because everybody gets scared and it's a natural tendency. Uh, but the fear is what creates the opportunity. You know, if everybody was thinking, oh, it's the greatest time in the world, some of these deals we wouldn't get, you know, like the one I bought, <clears throat> uh, what a month ago for $42,000. Well, it's a $140,000 house, um, with the, with the care in it, you know, and it should have sold for 80, $85,000, you know, 90,000 as is. And, and people would have been okay with making just this tiny bit of margin on it, but because everybody's afraid, well, that's the best time for us to do a deal is because everyone's afraid. And as long as our deal makes sense and we know we're going to keep this for cash flow, we know the outcome, we know the renter, we know we we know that avatar, we know who the end the end user of this product is. We know who the tenant is, we know who's going to pay for it. We know there's no shortage of that person. Um, there's no fear in doing the deal on our part. It's just, Hey, evaluate it. Does it make sense? Does it make money? Let's do the deal. Um, and that's the way you should be looking at it. It doesn't matter if rates are 18% or 4%, you know, if it makes sense, do the deal. Um, if it makes money, do the deal. It, it's, it's that simple. They were still doing deals back in the seventies and eighties when, <clears throat> when rates were, you know, 12, 18% interest, you know, it sounds crazy to us now, but the world was still going on. Deals were still getting done. Uh, just everything adjust in the deal so that you can make it work. So this is turning way long winded. We're going to look at some 1031s today, or we're going to look at some property today. I'll probably show you some property on things, uh, kind of throw some clips in here. Um, and, and maybe we can walk back through some things, but do the deal if it makes sense. And the 1031 is a great opportunity to step up your game and step into a nicer property to get more property or put yourself in a better deal. Now you can get burned on this too. Uh, you know, if you can't find anything and doesn't work, <coughs> uh, worst case scenario, we pay taxes on that. Um, you know, we've owned it for several years, so, uh, we pay taxes on the income. It just goes to the bottom line. Um, you know, maybe you go out and buy something to do an offset on the income, um, for the tax value. So there's many strategies even there. Um, but the, the goal would be to grow the portfolio in a way that we can grow our uh, tax or our cash flow and continue playing the game, you know, because we're taking cash flow away by selling this house. So we've got to replace that cash flow and increase the cash flow. That's the name of the game. So anyhow, appreciate you listening. This has turned way too long. I'm sure I lost a hundred people, hundreds of people bailed long time ago. So if you did stick it out, I appreciate it. Uh, Y'all have a great day.